welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words, too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah, and I am so delighted to welcome Gabriella Houston back onto the podcast to talk about The Storm Child. Hello, thank you for inviting me again. <laughs> that was so lovely to see you again. Yeah. And thank you for sharing your excellent book with us. <laughs> uh, glad you liked it. <laughs> Enough to invite me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, after after the wind child, of course, we're going to have you back on for the storm child. Yeah, but in some ways, it's like, you know, because you did at least tell me that you enjoyed the wind child. <laughs> so, you know, when if someone enjoys the first book, then the like sequel, the expectations are set. So I'm I'm really happy. I've been getting really positive feedback so far on it. But yeah. Well, I can definitely say that you're about to get some more. <laughs> yeah, yes, Stormchild exceeded my expectations. It was wonderful. Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. Just sort of keep amping up the, the atmosphere and, and the pace <laughs> as you go. Yeah, but that kind of completes the narrative. So it's just the, the two of them. Well, before we dive deeper into this conversation, what's something great that happened for everybody? Gabriella? So we were just chatting before the recording started. Today is a coronation day in the UK. So I've been watching that on the telly, but I do not count it as a great thing that happened to me personally today. <laughs> so so this week, the Storm Child actually came out uh, on the 4th. And so it was my first in-person book launch. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's really nice. So it basically the timing of when my first two books came out, The Second Bell and then The Wind Child, it was either lockdown or kind of still everything shut down, you know, pandemic times. So I had online launches, which are nice in their own way because they kind of allow for greater accessibility and, you know, people can sort of tune in from wherever they are. But there's something quite special about having a, an in-person one. And my local Waterstones basically offered to to host it. And yeah, and we had a full house and it was, it was really nice. Congratulations. That sounds lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I was, I was really buzzing, actually, because sort of beforehand you get a bit nervous like oh what if there's like not enough people or what if there's too many people because there's like a strict limit on what the bookshops are allowed to have in and then it was just sort of just right and you know and, and then you when you're talking about book you're talking to a whole room full of friendly faces so that was a great feeling definitely better than the coronation yeah <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion <laughs> My good thing is that I used electric hair clippers for the first time. I started cutting my husband's hair over the pandemic, as I think a lot of people did. <laughs> and recently I said, hey, if I'm going to keep cutting your hair, I should probably do it right and not just use scissors and hope and wish I do my best. <laughs> Yeah. so I bought some like actual and how did it go because it's not easy people think oh it's just clippers you know it has automatic sort of setting it's not as easy as it looks I would say the back looks better than it did when I was just trying to use scissors and get as close as possible to his head because that's not yeah. how you're supposed to cut hair <laughs> I mean you know hats are in that's true yeah it's always an option <laughs> yeah it's just the transition from where I used the clippers to where I stopped is a little abrupt. <laughs> it goes from short to long a little bit quickly. But I think for my first try, not bad. He's happy with it. He's out seeing friends today, so he's not hiding in shame. So I'm calling that Fair a enough. success. <laughs> Catch yourself on the back. Yeah. Good effort. <laughs> Unless when he says he's going out with his friends, he's actually going to a barber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll see when he gets back. I'm like, is this hair on your shoulder? Where, where are these hair clippings from? <laughs> Maybe we'll just think like, oh, I did a much better job than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> wow, it looks so good a couple of days later. Sarah, what's your good thing? My good thing is that I went to the nursery and bought some plants. And I even planted them before the rain came. So they got nice and watered. I mean, I watered them too, but they continued to get nice and watered. And then hopefully I will have lots of tomatoes and cucumbers and beans and peas and all sorts of lovely things nice. fingers crossed That's my kind of garden yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> and what's everyone drinking this afternoon i planned on having a mimosa but i could not open the champagne so i'm just drinking seltzer water and orange juice <laughs> i don't actually know what goes into a mimosa so if you said that you're drinking a mimosa i would not <laughs> it traditionally is some kind of sparkling wine and orange juice. Mm. They're very nice, but I, I failed in my attempts. <laughs> because 8 p.m. here, 
like just sticking to water. I should have prepared myself a little better. I knew this question was coming <laughs> and I should have said something a bit more exciting than that, but I'm sticking to water. Water is a totally legitimate response to this question. Staying hydrated is important. Yes. I have a cream Earl Grey tea, which is quite nice. Cream Earl, Earl Grey? What makes it cream? What's cream Earl Grey? So presumably there is some ingredient that gives it that creamy taste. Uh, I didn't add any like milk or cream to it. Hmm. Is it. So it's with a creamer in it. No, no, no. So I didn't add any creamer to it. It just like, that's the name. Let me see if I can Google the ingredients. Interesting. Cause Earl Grey, you would usually have black anyway. Yeah. I mean, and I, I don't add stuff to my tea. I'm sorry. I'm just weirdly interested in your tea now. <laughs> So, okay, it says hints of vanilla, bergamot, and cornflower petals give this organic, high grown Sri Lankan black tea its cream taste. So, I thought Earl, all Earl Grey had bergamot in it. That's the main thing. Yes. Bergamot okay. Earl yes. Grey, I don't know. I, I don't get the, the cream bit, but it doesn't matter. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. It's yeah. all right. <laughs> I, I think it's probably the vanilla and the cornflower that makes it creamier. But it's it's quite nice. It's very appropriate for this gray afternoon. Lovely. Well, since this is a book podcast, other than the book we're about to discuss, has anyone read anything good lately? You guys probably read a lot for your podcast. The last book I finished actually was The Redemption of uh, Morgan Bright, and it's an upcoming book. Oh, that's by it's... Chris Panettiere, yeah? Yeah, it's by Chris Panettiere. So it's still a few months before it comes out. I'm not actually entirely sure. I think it's out in July or August. Something like that. I'm not entirely sure. I thought it was coming out next year. Or oh, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, possibly. I mean, the cover is out, so Yeah. But anyway, it's a really nice perk of being an author that people send you books early. And yeah, and actually, just like a little plug, The Redemption of Morgan Bright is a really, really good book. And it's really interesting because Chris shows his versatility in it. So he has a very different voice in this book from what you might be used to with his sort of previous, more humorous sort of bent light-hearted kind of books it's very dark it's about a woman who goes into a mental asylum so in a near future kind of dystopian version of america uh, she goes to an asylum to try and find out what happened to her sister and it's it, it really plays with your head and it's just it, 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 it it's a very interesting book and he sort of finds a very different voice in this one so that's something for your pbr lists yeah you're just teasing us <laughs> yeah i'm i'm excited for this one it is actually on our podcast schedule one of the few books that we have on our podcast schedule for next year because i do try to not schedule us too far in advance i'm not always successful but the redemption of morgan bright is on there that Def definitely deserves a, a spot mm -hmm. well and chris is marvelous we love him so he's a lovely guy and a very entertaining one so a great person to invite mm -hmm. I have read nothing. <laughs> Except for The Storm Child. Of course, yes. But we're about to talk about that for like an hour. So <laughs> I had some chance to read last night. So I finished. Uh, I didn't finish. I read about another 150 pages of Eyes of the Void by Adrian Tchaikovsky, which I'm really enjoying. Somehow it's been slow going reading this book. And I'm not sure why, because like the plot is intriguing. The characters are great. The writing is great. I just am having a hard time with it. But it's I think that's a me problem and not a book problem. Because it's a good it's a good book, but it's also very long. Yeah, sometimes you just need to sort of put it down and go back to it. Mm -hmm. but it depends on you having the discipline to do that, because I, every time I do that with a book, I just never go back to it. Mm -hmm. And I sort of put, put it down and be like, it's a me problem. You know, I'll come back <laughs> to it when I'm in the mood. And then I'm like, well, I put it down already. So... I think actually my problem with this book is the opposite. It's that I've put it down too much because I've had to break it up with reading podcast books and, and reading some other stuff. Mm. So like I keep doing it in spurts. And I think this is a book that really benefits from a more consistent reading than I've given it. I mean, to be fair, most books do. <laughs> yeah. You should at least remember who the characters are. Yeah. Oh, speaking of... At the beginning of The Storm Child, we were given a very handy little list of characters 
which I appreciated immensely since it's been <laughs> yes. about a, a year since we read the first one. I don't remember yeah. that. It's, it's been about a year, yeah. It's not so much like, you know, it's not like a full list of characters, right? It's basically the creatures and the gods. So it's more like an introduction to for people to sort of get a hang of a kind of the world and its many monsters and spirits. Perhaps I should have done like a full character list I did not think about because I did the <laughs> creatures and gods index thing at the beginning and then I did the actual glossary at the end so I thought that what you had was the right amount like I didn't necessarily need a full character list because yeah. the characters come back up pretty quickly like you you remember who they are once you start reading but it was nice to have that list of gods that you don't see quite as often to kind of refresh your memory okay I'll, I'll keep it in mind it's like it's for a future <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of, oh, we are going to be discussing The Storm Child, which is a sequel to The Wind Child. So we are absolutely going to be giving spoilers for The Wind Child. So if anyone is going to be disappointed by that, go read that first. And, and then listen, listen to, the to our interview. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> listen to our interview with Gabriella about The Wind Child and then come back to this. All right. I just wanted to make sure that that didn't surprise anybody. But yeah, we we jump back in right into the action following Mara and Tornev and well I have a lot of opinions but a good thing there's a spoiler section huh <laughs> <laughs> amazing I want to hear all of us <laughs> oh this book was just so heartbreaking but like in a good way <laughs> it breaks you but it builds you up a little bit as well yeah it I, like I said spoiler section <laughs> <laughs> how's your writing process changed from when you wrote the previous book in this series uh, no, for the simple reason that basically I wrote them together. I wrote them one after the other. And The Storm Child, I wrote entirely during the first lockdown in the UK. So when everything closed down, I had literally just been finishing editing uh, The Wind Child when the world exploded. And then I, I, I spent the next sort of few months writing The Storm Child. And because there was no gap as well, and I had this very clear arc in my head that I wanted to complete because each book has its it's a duology so it was always intended as a duology as well there's no sneaky like cliffhangers at the end you know it's not like I'm just waiting for the okay from a publisher <laughs> to talk about volume three it's just it's a duology so each book has its own individual arc but I also wanted those books to kind of marry each other and to have those big overarching issues that do get resolved over the course of the two books so it made sense for me to write them together so it, it, it was I mean saying that like I am a like what's called answer right so I don't plan the whole book out but I do have an idea about what I want to discuss and where I want things to go so that's sort of what I followed. So this might not be entirely relevant for you because, as you say, you, you wrote the two books basically back to back. But do you think that there are any challenges specific to continuing a series versus starting it? Is Does that change your approach at all? or It depends on whether you have sold the first book or not. Yeah, but I think that would be the main one because for me, it was quite easy to, if there was any consistency issue, I could literally go back and just fix it I didn't have to stick to everything I've created I mean I did because I didn't actually you know I didn't make any errors <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrible I made plenty of errors just not in continuity but when I talk to my friends who write series or write trilogies it, once the first book is, is out you're kind of stuck with a certain structure you're stuck with the characters going in a certain direction and then if in the middle of book two or book three you decide oh I, I really wish I could have done this it doesn't always work so you kind of like in life you know you can't always gps your way out of you know like turn around when possible so, so <laughs> sort of situation so for me it was easier because I wrote them together so that wasn't such a huge issue and it, it was essentially like writing a full sort of adult book in some ways you know, just with two separate parts. Was there ever a consideration of publishing it as one volume, just with part one, part two? Or did you always sort of see it as two separate novels? I mean, I saw them as two separate novels for the simple reason that children's books just work like that. So if it suddenly became like a huge bestseller, then, you know, maybe there would be like a collected edition down the line. But children's books, for each category, they tend to be of of a certain length that 
people expect. And mm-hmm. so it wouldn't have made a lot of sense to put them together necessarily. And also they, they do have, you know, there's a year's difference between the wind child and where the storm child starts. So in that sense, it also makes sense for them to be separate. But of course, if someone wanted to down the line do a nice collected hard you know, I would never say no. <laughs> Leather bound, embossed, yeah. Yes, <laughs> Beautiful yes. illustrations I mean, for each chapter. Yeah, spade edges, all that stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about the, the year in between for the characters, how do you manage character growth versus consistency, especially when you have like a, a time gap like that? over a duology or a, a multi-book arc? It's kind of going, you know, 12 to 13, you know, 14 for the characters. So obviously there's a slight shift in how grown, grown up they are, but also they've been on the run for a year at the beginning of the story world, right? So Crochet the Deathless, whose soul, uh, Mara Stoll, is hunting them. And they've been able to evade them this long because of Mara's uh, knowledge, her intimate knowledge of how the spirit world works in the Slavic world. And I wanted them to be a bit more grown up. I knew that the storm child was going to be a bit darker and their experiences would have aged them as well. Because, you know, the, the, the Slavic sort of world of folklore is not a very forgiving one. It, it's a very dark world. And I did not sort of infantilize it if that makes sense. That's the kind of world that they inhabit and that's the sort of start point. So, you know, consistency, they were still the same people, but I did age them in what I thought would have been appropriate for a year of basically, you know, trying to run for your life. Yeah, and they they do go through some pretty horrible things. So it makes sense that they would be aged a little bit by those experiences. I was struck with how much faster paced this book felt than the first one. In the first book, there's sort of that like slow, deep breath at the beginning before Mara really jumps into this supernatural world and her adventures. Whereas on this one, we just hit the ground running along with Mara and Tornov, <laughs> and it never stops. It I don't remember how long it took me to read it, but I think I sat down and like did not stop until I was finished. Aww. Partially because it's a shorter book, but I <laughs> like there's no point where I'm like, oh yeah, I can wait to find out what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, that is a lovely thing to hear. With the wind child, you know, I'm very much aware of that. People in the English-speaking world are not very familiar with Slavic mythology. They're not very familiar with the culture, with the landscapes. You know, the, the things that were part of my childhood, you know, I'm very much aware that they're different to what the, the readers in the UK will have been familiar with. So there's the, what we what call exposition tax. I didn't do a huge amount of exposition because it's children's books. But definitely in The Wind Child, I kind of wanted to have that introduction so that you really feel like you're a part of this world and so that you understand how it works and that the rules are different also because it was about how slow you know a a child might be to learn to trust again if they've spent their childhood being quite isolated and lonely so that takes time you you can't really rush it the second book is it's about being on the run basically and it's about how Mara and Tornev are now fully in this world and there's no escaping it. And I think the pace had to re- reflect that as well. Once you're actually in this type of adventure, you can't just escape it. You can't take a break and have a time out. And all the other things that they have to deal with in terms of their sort of changing sense of identity or how they view themselves in this world, how they're viewed, how they, how they look, you know, all of those things that it's like in the real life, you know, you can't put a pause on everything that's happening around just because you're having a bit of a crisis. I mean, they they do have, and I don't want to say too much because we're not in the spoiler section yet. They, they do have kind of a, a small period of peace or a pause, but something that I really appreciated was that the story makes it very clear that whilst things are kind of on hold for them or they're ignoring things, the world around them is not on hold and their their enemies are not you know, pausing just because Mara and Tornov are. Yes, I mean, I, I, exactly. So, you know, I think in life as well, like when people talk about, you know, happiness versus contentment and, you know, people who kind of chase happiness, they chase those real highs and, and that they're never truly happy because life is just finding contentment where you are. 
And in that sense as well, like for Maratona, they are appreciating the moment when they can kind of catch a breath and sort of reevaluate their situation. And children will do that as well. Children are much quicker to find those moments where they can just kind of adapt and calm themselves in a way. In, in some ways, you know, they, they do it better than adults. But, but then the real world comes in again. Yep. Can't leave yep. it forever. <laughs> <laughs> so in most stories, or at least the stories that I'm familiar with, I feel like we see mortals trying to attain divinity. But in this book, we instead focus on Mara trying to cling to her human side that we see her lose at the end of the first book. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was really neat, the the focus on the importance of mortality instead of just everyone trying to be a god felt very new and different, and I loved it. I think... In reality, if you had like, you know, like, so Mara grew up around her mother's skin. So she grew up in the house of the winds, the house of her grandfather, the god of winter winds. And so she is intimately familiar with the gods and the spirits. And she does not idolize them in any way because they have been the source of her extreme uh, sort of loneliness and isolation as a child. Because she grew up looking like a human child, completely powerless. She saw how difficult the gods found it to even relate to her in any way. And so she would have no reason to want to be a part of that because she saw her father and his ability to be content and happy and the warmth that came with sort of those human familial bonds that are based in mortality, really. And so she clung to that. And I think the biggest part of that is that Over the course of the first book, as she tries to bring her father back, she really clings to her human side and she only discovers her sort of God side, her wind child side, because it's necessary for her to try and bring her father back. So it's not a side that she's particularly proud of. It's not a side that she is, you know, revels in. It's just something like an unfortunate sort of means to the end that she sort of utilizes but when her human soul is ripped from her and she suddenly looks like a wind spirit she you know she she has to sort of come to terms with that as well and the fact that people see her differently now so she can no longer hide behind her sort of human looks in order to avoid being categorized together with the family that she doesn't feel very close to It's something that's really interesting to me personally because, you know, people's identity shifts and changes. It's not innate in any way. It's something that comes to us from our surroundings, from culture, like the family we grew up to, our friends that we adopt, you know, like into our lives. And I think having that sort of moment where you accept those changes to how you see see yourself, it's actually very freeing and understanding that it's not fixed like for her it wasn't fixed at all and she sort of discovers the opportunity that comes with saying you know this is mine too and this is mine and 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 I can have all of that and you know the same for Tornip we have a bit more of his journey in this book as well in in terms of can he hide behind the kind of bare skin like indefinitely or can he come to terms with who his family is I have so many questions about Tornip But they are all in the spoiler (laughs) section. So let's jump on in there. But first, one last question for Sarah. Why should you read this book? You should read this book if you are a young person, if you were a young person at any point in your life, if you enjoy magical adventures with heartfelt relationships and various complex family dynamics, you should absolutely read this book. But you should probably read The Wind Child first. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) that's a lovely recommendation (laughs) it just gets stamped on every book (laughs) to avoid spoilers skip to 5150 something that I noticed when we were compiling our notes about this book was how much about Torniv's plotline revolved around the concept of choice And I think it it first got brought up when Mara was contemplating her own transformation into being sort of the more godlike version of herself and comparing it to Torniv, who not only chose the bear transformation to begin with somewhat, it was offered to him, but he's able to go back and forth and 
uh, that I got lost entirely. <laughs> you, 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 you did get lost. Because I would, I would actually argue that Mara has a lot more choice than Tornif does. I mean, Tornif, he can't choose at the beginning of the of the story he can't choose when he transforms like that's right. just a, a day night thing wasn't the power offered to him in the first book though it wasn't forced upon him if i remember it was so basically tornif tornif has choice but it's it's a choice that all hinges upon him choosing mara so he chooses mara he chooses to be there for mara and you know he chose to take the bear skin to help her in her quest to find her father he chose to leave with her he chose to be there for her every step of the way you could argue that when a child loves someone that's not really a choice anymore but when it comes to the bear skin it's for torn i think it's a bit more complicated than than just wanting to help mamara because he really revels in the power it gives him you know so just to sort of remind those who don't remember the beginning of the wind child Tornif is half Botrish, half Prisanian. So he is mixed race, living, uh, was brought up by his father. His mother was gone. He was told that she was dead. He wasn't sure whether it was true, but that's what he was told. And for m- most of his childhood, he was a bit of an outcast in his village. You know, he looked a bit different. Everybody held his mother's heritage against him. So when he met Mara, he really latched on to her as they said, like, oh, this is someone who is half and half as well and someone who understands what it is like to not really belong anywhere because he doesn't have any of his mother's sort of cultural knowledge he doesn't have any connection to his botrish side all he has is the look that sets him apart from the other children in the village and so when he has that option to turn into a bear to have a bit of magic you know that is no child will turn that down (laughs) i mean if if we're being honest Mm -hmm. No child would have turned down a magical shape-shifting ability. So for Tornif, that was like, there was a choice that he made for Mara. But it's also a choice that he kind of wanted to make for himself. I think it's interesting for me that, or or striking anyway, that so many people Mm -hmm. try to take his element of choice like away from him in the sense that they know that he would choose Mara. So they tell Mara, you should tell him to do something because otherwise he's going to choose you. I think it's like, you know, how we treat children very often. You know, it's it's something that shouldn't happen, but we do make children choose sometimes between family members, right? When a family breaks apart and people try to alienate the child from other family members. And it often comes with like, you know, oh, it'll be for your own good. So it's... It's not as straightforward with Torna because obviously the people who ask Mara to sort of step aside are people who are telling her, like, we can give him a true home. You don't have the ability to give him a true home because of who you are. You just look like a wind spirit now because they, they can't really see her human side anymore. So all they see is this wind spirit that is on the run that has caused a great deal of suffering to this child that they want to claim. And so when people from the Baltish community sort of meet him, they have a very strong sense of community bond, right? And it's like, you are of our blood, so you should want to be a part of us because only we can protect you. So, you know, it comes from a good place, but it, it and, and it's, I think it's very complicated because, you know, we like in a very individualistic sort of Western understanding of it, we like to think about taking people's choices away as, a purely negative thing that often comes from like some kind of wicked, you know, intention. But when your point of view is less individualistic and more kind of community based, then then that point of view shifts as well. So I think it's very difficult to kind of when we are trying to figure out what's best for a person and what's best for a community, because those two things don't always sort of overlap in quite the way we would want them to. And I mean, to to be fair, it definitely does seem like all, all of the community is saying we we want what's best, what we think is best for Tornev. Like it's not, it's not coming from a place of trying to exert power at all. But on the other hand, I kind of can't help but wonder like, I mean, this this child does turn into a bear half of the time. I mean, like you're not really equipped for that. <laughs> even, even if you have good intentions, even if you want to bring him into your into your community. 
But I think, you know, it's a part of it is like people see what they want to see and what they what they understand within their often a very narrow experience. You see it sometimes in the context of like people trying to, uh, uh, I don't know if I should be bringing it into conversations or quite annoying <laughs> like for me, but when people are talking about cultural appropriation. So cultural appropriation is a very nuanced idea that's been sort of hijacked by social media and by people who clearly don't have the scope to grasp all the nuanced sort of elements of it. And it's been taken to a kind of absurd, sound bitey level. But we, it's basically used to like weaponize to try and gatekeep cultures. And a lot of it's being done, pardon me for being truthful, but <laughs> it's, it's done from purely American perspective. So American perspective on race and culture is very different to the perspective on race and culture in other parts of the world. And when you're trying to impose your context onto others, it can become a big issue, especially when, you know, I hear I was a person who did my online launch for the service Dawn Child. She is half Moroccan and half Irish. And she looks far more Irish when she does Moroccan. She's a redhead. And she was saying she's an artist. And she's like, oh, I would love to illustrate the Arabian Nights. And people are telling me that I shouldn't because it's cultural appropriation. As well. But it's your culture as well. <laughs> You're a Moroccan. It's it, it's insanity that you, we would be putting those limits based on, on on who they are. And like you know, my children are mixed race, but you would not be able to tell, especially with one of them. So what she's not allowed to you know interact with her grandmother's culture. It's a it becomes a very absurd thing. But when people look at someone, they think they know where that person's coming from. They think they know their context, and that is exactly what happens with Tornet, you know and. That is exactly what happens with Mara as well. In the first book, her grandmother says, well, you look like us. That means you're holy us, you know, the, the gaunt of the blood is strong. So <laughs> so you're really just, just human. And that ignores her mother's heritage entirely. And even though Mara kind of seeks to distance herself from the wind spirits, she doesn't want her mother erased from her history either. And it's not true. It doesn't feel true to her. And in the same way, you know, Torna, you know, he was brought up by his very loving father. So for people to say, well, you're just Botrish, doesn't feel right either. Even though, you know, he was treated as if he was for most of his childhood, but he knows it's not true for him. It's a very difficult, you know, issue that often doesn't have a clear cut answer, except for allowing people to just claim cultures that they want with both hands you know and it's just you know why do you have to choose if you're mixed culture mixed race why, why do you have to choose which one belongs to you well they all belong to you you know you should enjoy them both you know this year i have lived in the uk for exactly the amount of time i lived in poland before i moved here and i can see the shift in myself and how i see things and how i interact with people you know it's like a small cultural markers that do shit and so, so this place is mine as well. I mean, that's how I feel about it. And of course, when English people see me, they just see a foreigner. <laughs> you know, well, well, maybe not see, but when they hear me, they can hear a foreigner because my accent sort of remains. But it, I think the answer in that respect is to, is to be a little bit more forgiving of how people want to interact with the culture around them and to embrace it as well, because that's, that's culture building, isn't it? That's interesting, too, because isn't it most beneficial when people get to experience as many different cultures as possible? Because then they won't feel the instinct to other them, right? They'll they'll be more welcoming overall. Exactly. And, you know, it's you have writers sometimes who like basically spend years living in a different country and they, they just really embrace it and they love it. And it's, it's an author, I I'm trying to find, while I'm saying it, I'm trying to remember <laughs> his name and I think I will fail. There's a writer who basically wrote a first ladies detective agency series and they are set in Botswana and they're the most optimistic, lovely. And he basically write, write he's a white dude who lived in Botswana and he uh, wrote about uh, the, the two main protagonists are two black ladies who are starting a ladies detective agency. And the love for that country that just oozes from every page is just, it's just so positive and so lovely. And you learn so many things. And it's like, so in the current climate, he would not be allowed to write it probably. 
right? Because it's like, well, but you are not none of those things that you represent. But it's just such a wonderful and like clearly the sort of knowledge he has of that country and the deep love he has for that country. Like it's it's just evident in every page. And I think we should be celebrating that because, you know, when you start cutting, like like you said, uh, Lily, like when you start cutting people off from different cultures, you, you kind of create more misunderstandings and you create more distance in ways that are very negative. It's interesting too that you you bring up having characters that don't look like you, especially in an age where representation is so important. How can a straight white male author have representation in his books if he's not allowed to write characters who aren't like him? It's sort of a catch-22. Yeah, it's like with everything, you know, if you if you don't do something well, that's when it becomes a problem. And I think having self-awareness is very important. Like, I know what my limits are of my research capabilities, right? And if I really want to write something and, you know, I start doing research and then I like, the more you find out, the more you see, oh, okay, do I really want to read those 10 books <laughs> on, the, on the history of Islam? Probably not, you know? So you have to be aware of what you can and can't research and if it's worth it for you. But we live in a very diverse you know, global world and, you know, there's sort of Slavic lands of the kind of 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. Uh, you know, but Prasan is, is based after. There were fairly diverse places, you know, you had your Tatars, you had your uh, Roma tribes, you had uh, sort of Jewish communities, you know, both the Orthodox Jewish communities and the sort of more assimilated, which sort of had their own there was a very different sort of feel to those two groups as well. They're not homogenous. And 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 you had Cossacks, you know, you had you had like some Germans living in the South, like you had obviously Russians, you had and it's this idea that when you look at Poland now, it is a very homogenous country. It didn't used to be. And so in order to have that sort of authentic feel to it, you should be preserving all of that diversity as well. But that of course requires research. And I did do a lot of research <laughs> into, because obviously the Botrish community that Tornet belongs to is very, you know, it's a very thinly veiled Romani tribes and how they kind of functioned in, in, in sort of Eastern Europe at that time. Speaking of Tornev and meeting his Botrish family, one of the characters that we meet in this book is Vadim, who we eventually find out is Tornev's half-brother. and. Sort of similar to Torniv, Vadim ends up joining Mara on this quest, but for very different reasons. And I thought that sort of comparison, difference, was striking. <laughs> it was very striking contrast, yeah. yeah. That was the word, contrast. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, he obviously doesn't have the kind of bond with Mara that Torniv does. And so, you know, Vadim is it's a child. That was, you know, quite, that was, you know, it was, he was an orphan child. And, you know, he was, he is a part of sort of Mama Bohina's sort of traveling orphanage situation. But he's, you know, Tornet is his, as much resentment as he might feel towards Tornet for basically having had the family and being the reason why his mother is not there. He also recognizes that, that Tornev is his family. And he has that instant, like, well, he is my family, so he's fully mine. So he has that desire to, to claim him. And he does recognize that, that the bond that Tornev and Mara have is uh, an obstacle to that as well. Yeah, he spends a lot of time kind of picking at that, it feels like, in a, in a mostly friendly, childish way. But I mean, he's a teenager as well. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, he's a teenager, so he's a bit of a dick. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, his attitudes as well are different. They're a little bit more grown up, and especially when it comes to kind of attitude to girls. And his sort of review of girls is very different as well. So there is a bit of tension there. We spent a lot of our last episode discussing Zavena, Mara's mother, and sort of this different version of motherhood that we see in their relationship. And Zavena comes back in this book, and I think her relationship with her daughter goes through a lot, does definitely go through some changes. It seemed like they were able to relate to each other 
better by the end of this book. They sort of understood each other on a different level. I think there's a lot of kind of personal growth on both sides that's involved. And that is that is very common to mother-daughter relationships anyway, especially, you know, the difficult relationships where you grow up and you sort of start to understand your mother a little bit better than you did before. And it's, uh, you know, Z- Zevena did not have any way to express her feelings in a way that Mara could possibly understand. So it's like, you know, I'm not sure if we talked about it at the last uh, podcast we did, but, you know, when people talk about love languages and, you know, Zevena and Mara do not share a love language. And it's, you know, in this book, Zevena's sort of personal growth in a way is being able to recognize that Mara needs something from her. She needs her to sort of verbalize her emotions because otherwise she won't know she won't understand and that is a very big shift for Zavena and you know the, the way kind of we view parental responsibility as well is very different for Zavena and her family because you know very mortal beings very very kind of very powerful but they're also very like like many gods in many different uh, mythologies they are not necessarily nice you know they're not they they don't have the same drives that humans do in in many ways beyond sort of satisfying their pride or or whatever they want in the moment so there's also like something i was thinking about in in the context of this is uh, malcolm gladwell's uh, book sort of talking to strangers if you guys have read it it discusses all the ways in which humans are terrible at communicating between cultures so much is lost in translation. And, you know, it's like what, what we were talking about earlier when it comes to people trying to imprint their cultural context onto people from other cultures. It's partially to try and understand them, but that just leads to misunderstandings because we don't all think the same. And I think part of growing is understanding that other people do not have the same frame of reference we do. You know, it doesn't make them bad people. It just means that they don't think in the same way that I do. And maybe I can learn something from them. Maybe they can learn something from me, but I can't impose it on them. And I can't judge them for thinking in in a different way. And I think that recognition, that moment of recognition is crucial for Mara and Savannah's relationship, where they realize, well, we are not the same. You don't necessarily understand my context, but I'm trying to kind of go, instead of expecting you to come all the way to me and understand me as I am, I'm going to try and sort of tiptoe over to your side and express myself in a way that you understand. And I think they both did that part of the way. And of course, you know, Mara has been carrying a lot of resentment towards her mother. And I think only because of that, there's a moment when, you know, Mara has this outburst and she tells her mother that you basically have abandoned me. And it's you can sort of see Zavena's shock at the back because that is not how she saw it at all. That is not how she understood her own actions. And it's a very hard moment to realize where you've failed at something quite critical and where you've really failed at your duties. And that is a moment where Zavena can sort of realize I've been going about it my way and I have to try something different now. Well, and I I think it it leads to one of my favorite quotes in the book is uh, Zavanna talking about how like there are some things that she doesn't understand about about Mara, and she says, "But I suppose that's my fault too for not taking the pains to learn." And you really see that that growth and that realization in her that she has, like you say, has been looking at this just from her own context, and she hasn't considered the ways in which Mara is different and doesn't view the world as she does because she has these different life experiences. I think it's something that is quite familiar to a lot of parents, right, in in general, because there's a part of you, you know, like, I mean, I can now speak from experience because I have the kids. And, and, you know, when you first have your baby as a woman, there's a part of you that expects them to come out like you. Like there's a part like you you don't necessarily voice that. It's something that is like sub- a very subconscious level. You you expect your baby came from you to have 
a similar sort of, you know, character or a sim- similar sort of way of experiencing world. And you can like guide them in this way of, of experiencing world. And when they very, very quickly, you start seeing their own personalities. And it's much quicker than people think, you know, they're not like a blank canvas. They have their own way of expressing themselves, their own way of being. Some are more extroverted, some are more introverted. And and you have to adjust how you are and how you express yourself so that they understand because it's about them now. And sometimes people fight very hard against that and they keep trying to keep the frame of reference just to what they understand. It's just like, no, 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 you have to, like the child has to adapt and come all the way to me to understand what is expected of them or how I express things. Like they should understand me rather than thinking, okay, well, this fits this child. You know, this is what this child's needs are. And I'm going to try and adjust my behavior and my way of expressing myself so this child can thrive. And I think for, you know, Zavena, this moment comes very late, you know, because her child has already been independent for a very long time and in pretty brutal ways as well. But this moment does come for Zavena, you know, and it's credit where credit is due. And she has her incredible scene at the end where she fakes out Koshe, the villain. It didn't trick me. I was like, okay, Zavena, where are you going with this? <laughs> but that that point where she pretends to get back together with him in order to distract him for Mara was just like such a good feeling. Because you were like, yeah, mom, you're like you're showing up. You're you're helping her out. It was so good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think for me it really worked on multiple levels because like as a reader, you understand, or as an as an adult reader, you understand mm-hmm. what Zavena's doing and that that she's faking him. But when you look at it from Mara's perspective, Mara's still kind of on the fence about it. She's she's like, Well, now you're you're just abandoning me again, which I guess this is what I should expect. So it, it feels really I don't want to say revelatory, but but like it it feels really a revelatory is fine. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's it's such a nice feeling to see Mara understand that actually Zavena is doing her best to care for her in, in the way that she can. And it, it feels like a really earned moment. You know, that's lovely to hear because obviously that was being intense because you want uh, this to be like, you know, if you're reading it as an adult rather than as a child, you want the, like, you want just like Mara, just like hold on for like a moment, like something good will come, like just, you know, hold on just for a bit longer, just have a little bit more trust. And I think um, as parents, we really want that moment, you know, just like, just trust me for a bit. Like you don't understand why I'm doing this. But like, just just hold on for a bit longer and just you'll get that. And then you'll understand why I'm doing it. And we don't always get that. <laughs> <laughs> but in a book written by me, we do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the ending a little bit more, because we have this wonderful, uh, like touching moment between Mara and Zavena. But then during this final conflict, there are some deaths that I did not see coming in this book <laughs> that... I, I had to take a minute. <laughs> like, yeah. did that really happen? Is, is there going to be someone wave their magic wand and fix everything at the end? Yeah, I was I was not expecting how bittersweet the ending would be. I mean, I think, I, don't get me wrong, I think the ending is perfect. I think it's it absolutely is fitting for the book. But mm-hmm. I guess just my expectations for a book aimed at younger readers is I was thinking there is going to be some kind of solution that that brought back people who had died. And we do not get that at all. We should have known after the first book. We should have known. <laughs> we should have known. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's because, you know, the, like the first book dealt with kind of childhood grief. And, you know, Mara is better equipped to deal with that. And of course, you know, she is not as close to her grandfather as she was to her father. But it's more about this sense that oh you know you you accepted me at the end why didn't you accept me you know earlier as well like that is something that but I think it's important you know for people in general to kind of but that's something that's really difficult to come to terms with sometimes you don't always get 
a neat resolution before someone dies. You don't always get to have like this long conversation where you kind of spill out, you know, your emotions and your feelings and you kind of, you have that one last moment where everything is resolved and that's when the chapter ends. You know, you don't, you don't get that. And I think in that way, like, you know, I, I, I am a great believer in treating sort of difficult topics with children with sort of dignity and honesty. And this just felt honest to me. It was beautiful, especially wrapped up with Mara sort of taking up the mantle of her grandfather and then choosing to handle it differently than he did was extremely moving. And then we had our, our very sweet ending. We see her return to her grandmother and there was definitely resolution. It didn't feel unresolved. Yeah, I think, in, you know, in terms of her relationship with her grandfather, you know, she was never going to have a relationship with him that mm-hmm. she would have wanted as a child because you know, he wasn't human in the end, you know, he wasn't, and he was never going to relate to her in a way that she had hoped as a child. And I think part of growing up is also to not expect people to be someone they're not. And, you know, sometimes to accept them in very, very imperfect versions that they are. I was actually, I mean, I really liked what happens with her grandfather and the way that it forces her to deal with some of those feelings and and her coming into her own power. But I was actually more sad about Uncle Borovi dying. I was just really sad about that. That was heartbreaking. That was harder than like her grandpa dying as well. Yeah. <laughs> it mm-hmm. was it was hard for me to write as well because I love Uncle Borovi. She had a relationship with him in a way that she didn't have a relationship with her grandfather. I just because they couldn't relate. But yeah, it was sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was sad, but it was necessary. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) No regret. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on. As always, it's a delight to have you. Can you let listeners know where you can be found on the internet, where they can buy your books, which they absolutely should do (laughs) right now? (laughs) (laughs) So The Wind Child and The Storm Child are available in the UK at the moment working on the US side. You you guys gotta tell your editors to work with us. (laughs) (laughs) Fingers crossed. I'll text them, you know. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Text somebody. Uh, You have somebody text them. But yeah, so so you can buy them in any kind of UK bookshops or Amazon. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it in um, the Croatian edition is out. So, you know, if you're in Croatia, you can get it. And I am found on many different places. Uh, I'm found on TikTok as at Gabriela Houston. Very easy to find. I'm to be found on Instagram at Gabriela Houston (laughs) one. Because I lost the login details to just get at Gabriela Houston. And I have a website, GabrielaHouston.com, where you can sort of find my email. And I'm also on TikTok, but... (laughs) (laughs) and i will say if you're in the u.s blackwells does ship to the u.s i think they offer free shipping so ooh, i did not know that yeah i didn't know that okay i'll be i will be publicizing that (laughs) yeah (laughs) i didn't realize i thought the shipping was very expensive no, I, I Blackwell's and Waterstones actually might offer free shipping to the u.s as well i'm not sure about that but I do, I do know for sure Blackwell's, at least on most books. Amazing. Let's stick with Blackwell's. Yeah. Blackwell's yeah. is often. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're work- currently working on any projects, if there's anything you can tell us about what's next for you. Anything you want to plug? So, well, yeah. what, what is next for me is my next adult novel. So, Oh, that's right. That's coming out in the fall, isn't it? Oh, yes. In October. So October 10th, The Bone Roots is coming out. And The Bone Roots is... Mm, very dark and it's it's adult fantasy it's about two mothers each trying to protect her daughter and only one of them will eventually succeed and only one of them knows why Mm. so again it's just chock full of slavic folklore and it's one of my favorite subjects and like basically familial bonds and mothers and daughters well, fantastic. I can't wait for October. It sounds very uh, atmospherically appropriate. <laughs> and if you guys want to schedule me in, <laughs> always open. <laughs> you guys have very good questions. 
No, thank you. And we always love talking to you. Uh, Well, thank you again so much for joining us. It has been fantastic talking to you about this book, and I can't wait to hear more. Thank you for inviting me again. I'm up for it anytime. (laughs) Or if you guys just want to chat about books, I'm okay. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We are on Twitter and Instagram at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at FictionFansPod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye! Bye.